Next, a special bonus segment. For the first time in 20 years, Dr. Dyer speaks about the profound and very personal event that transformed his own life. One of the most important ideas that I've ever encountered came from something I read uh, in Castaneda's very last book called The Active Side of Infinity. In The Power of Intention, I wrote an entire chapter on uh, you and your role with infinity. What he said in here that made such a profound impact on me was that um, he said the problem with humanity, with what people in the Western world who are not living of the source, is that we are all in bodies that are going to die. But we act as if they're not. And I thought about that, I've contemplated that whole idea a long time. That, uh, and he said, when you act as if you're in a body that is not going to die, you live on what he called the inactive side of infinity. And our objective here in connecting to intention is to move ourselves to the active side of infinity. The active side of infinity is the place where we recognize our infinite nature. And so we understand what Jesus meant when he spoke of uh, you are in this world, but you're not of this world. And almost all of us believe that we are in this world and that we are of this world as well. And we can't get past that idea. So that to move and understand our infinite nature is one of the more complicated and difficult things to do. But once you get it, you get it. I remember when I was living out in Mount Clemens, Michigan, at the home of a beautiful lady who took in children who were uh, uh, in the same kinds of conditions that I was in and that my mom was in. Um, I was born in 1940. My mother... Uh, uh, I had three boys under the age of four. I was the youngest. And uh, my father, when I was about one and a half or two, um, just left. And my mother divorced him, but he never uh, had three boys, and he never made a phone call, ever, in his entire life. Uh, never made any attempt to uh, contact uh, or pay any support. And I used to always wonder about how could someone, and my mother was one of these really beautiful, divine souls. I mean, she's, everybody, when I was, she got us back together when uh, I was nine years old, 1949. Um, and I used, to, all of my friends always wanted to come to our house because our house was the place where there was no judgment, it was fun, it was, we always had a good time, there was always something to eat for everybody. Um, and particularly, it was a, a, a happy, exciting, beautiful place. And um, I always wondered about how could a man leave a woman with three boys under the age of four uh, when he was uh, perfectly capable of, of staying and working. There was a war going on at that time and so on. And uh, he spent quite a few years of his life in prison. And, um, <clears throat> and I had this gnawing internal kind of desire to meet this man and to find him and I used to dream about him. I was filled with anger about him and, and so on. And um, the turning point in my life came when I shifted uh, my perceptions about my father. My father, um, all I knew was his name. His name was Melvin Lyle Dyer. I knew he was born in 1914. I, uh, I used to go to sleep at night and dream about meeting him. I used to wake up filled with anger, sweating sometimes. I would have these dreams where I would fight with him in my, uh, in my sleep. And I'd wake up just soaking wet, filled with anger. And in all of those years, up until I was uh, <clears throat> 34 years old, in 1974, I, uh, I dreamt about him almost every single night. And I always would ask my mother to uh, see if she could tell me something about him. Where was he? What, uh, what, she never wanted to, she's just filled with rage towards this man. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I got a note in uh, 1974 or 73 uh, informing me that uh, my father, 
This was from a cousin that I didn't know I had. Her name was Dorothy Phillips. And she told me that my father had died 10 years before, 1964, at the age of 49, of cirrhosis of the liver. And that he was um, buried in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. And that he died in uh, New Orleans. And that's all the information that she had. Well, my two brothers never wanted to hear a word about my father. I think partly because they remembered him. They were a year and two years older than me. Uh, and they didn't want any part of it. I had this sort of very innate kind of powerful inquisitiveness about who was this person. And more than anything, I wanted to know um, how could he do it? And did he acknowledge that he had uh, uh, three sons? Actually, I just wanted to know if, if he acknowledged that he had a son named Wayne. And I, uh, I was working, I was teaching at that time, uh, I was a professor at St. John's University in New York. Um, I was teaching counseling psychology. And that was the time of uh, a lot of the things that Lyndon Johnson had put into effect called the Great Society, and they were integrating some of the southern schools and so on. And I was given uh, a job with the federal government, a temporary job, to just uh, a part-time thing to go along with my professorship. I was to fly down to a place in Mississippi called the uh, Mississippi State College for Women in Columbus, Mississippi. And I thought to myself, I had just found out recently, I don't even know exactly how far back it had been, but I had found out that my father had died. And I looked on a map and I saw that Columbus was um, only 200 miles from Biloxi and I knew that my father's body had been shipped as an indigent from uh, New Orleans to Biloxi. So uh, <clears throat> I got down to uh, Columbus and I did, I sat in on classes and I wrote up my report on the civil rights laws and whether they were being uh, honored and so on. And then I rented a car and it was a Friday afternoon. And um, the car that I rented was a 1974 Dodge Coronet. It was blue. And in those days, they only had the lap belts. They didn't have the uh, shoulder belts, the shoulder harness. So this car, as weird as this all sounds, and my life at that time was really shaky. I was uh, drinking. I wasn't in a good uh, uh, kind of relationship I wanted to be in. My writing wasn't... Uh, I just couldn't seem to put it all together. I was overweight. Um, I, I had very little discipline. And I was very much ego involved in my life. And, um, but I always knew I had a different kind of a destiny. And I just couldn't seem to get it. And, and this stuff with my father was always there, this internal kind of rage. And so I went, uh, I got in this car. And the car was the, at an Avis rent-a-car place. And nobody had ever rented the car before. Nobody had ever driven the car before. It, w it had zero miles on the odometer, like 000. 000. 000.6 or something. It had been trucked in that day to be rented by me. So I rented this car. I got in, and I went to put on the seat belt, and I put the left belt on. And then I reached under to get the right belt, and there was no right-hand belt. Now, I was a fanatic about wearing seat belts and so on. So I got out of the car, and I wanted to find this, this belt. And I took the seat out, and I put it on the ground. And there, uh, taped to the floorboard of the car, was a uh, plastic, uh, 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 wrapped in plastic, was the buckle. And there was a rubber band around it, and the whole thing with masking tape was taped to the floorboard of the car. I guess to protect it from cutting the upholstery or whatever. So I took the stuff out, I took the rubber band off, I got the whole thing out, I put it up, put the seat in, reached in to put the buckle on, and inside of the buckle, there's a business card in this brand new car. And I looked at the card and it said, Candlelight Inn, Biloxi, Mississippi. And on the back, there was a map pr imprinted on how to get to this uh, Candlelight Inn. And I just had one of those flashing kinds of strange moments and said, that's weird. But I didn't think any more about it. I just put it in. I said, ah, somebody at the factory, whatever it is. And I just, I put it in my pocket. I said, but I'm going to Biloxi. So I drove to Biloxi. It was a Friday afternoon and um, at the end of August. And I pulled into the outskirts of uh, Biloxi. Welcome to Biloxi. And I pulled over and there was a gas station there. 
I drove into the gas station. There was a telephone with the yellow pages. And I went and looked up cemeteries. It's the only clue I had. And there were three listings, two very large listings and one real small minor listing. So I called the two. There was no answer at the first. Nobody answered at the cemetery. <laughs> second, one, uh, <laughs> second one I called uh, was busy, 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 busy. So I called this tiny little number, and this man came on. And I said, uh, and he had a southern drawl, and I said, uh, I'm calling to find out if there's a Melvin Lyle Dyer who died in 1964. I believe that was the exact date. And uh, would he um, be buried at your uh, cemetery? And he said, well, this isn't really a cemetery, but uh, they do bury people here. He said, um, I'll, uh, I'll check. And he was gone for at least 10 minutes. And he came back, and he was rifling through Coca-Cola uh, boxes, boxes that they had brought Coca-Cola in. This is how they filed things in Mississippi in those days. And he said, I found your father's record. He was buried here. Uh, in 1964. I said, well, I'm on a journey as my father. I've been searching for my father for my whole life. I would just like to go to, you know, uh, where he's buried. He said, well, it's not really a funeral home. He said, your father is buried on the grounds of the Candlelight Inn. True story. So I reached in my pocket. I said, I've got a map. <laughs> and I drove to this little place. This was like the turning point in my life and when I began to believe in the active side of infinity. And I went to this little marker on the ground. It wasn't even a gravestone there, just a little marker. And it said, Melvin Lyle Dyer. I'm not exactly sure of these dates, but I'm pretty sure it's 1914-1964. And uh, I stood there, and when I went in, the man said, well, he said, you can, uh, you can leave. When, when you do, just put the chain up over the fence and uh, over the driveway. Window. And I said, okay. And I was there, it was, five, it was about 5.15 or so, and I stayed there for almost three hours. It was dark now, it was 8 o'clock, and I just cursed at my father. And I just stomped on the ground, and I just said, how could you have done this? And how, what, what, was, what was in your mind, and how could you just leave, uh, oh, you know, and, oh, and why didn't you ever call? And, what? You know, and it was like this tearful, very powerful turning point, uh, peak experience in my life. And then something came over me, and I remember what... Uh, Mark Twain said about forgiveness, he said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And something came over me that had never come over me before, and I said to my father, I forgive you. I don't know why. I said, from this moment on, for the rest of my life, I will send you love. I will only see you in a loving light. And I put the chain up, I drove out, and I went home, I flew back up to New York, took a very brief sabbatical of about two weeks, and I went down to a place in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, called the Spindrift Motel. I checked in, and I wrote a book called Your Erroneous Zones. Today, there are 32 million copies of that book in 48 languages, and I wrote it in less than two weeks beginning to end. When I left there, I started running. And I started a running streak shortly after that that went for 22 years without missing a day, eight miles every day. I quit drinking. I entered into a different kind of a relationship in my life. The children that I had been wanting to began to show up in my life. I changed my diet around. I stopped uh, eating toxic foods and behaving in toxic ways. And everything that I have been able to create and accomplish in my life came about because of some mysterious way that a, a business card got put into a car that had never been driven and ended up in my shirt when I was going to the place where I was trying to find my father. I could never begin to explain all of that. It is all so mystically mysterious. But that act literally changed my life and turned my life around. And I can remember as a young boy living at 231 Town Hall Road at Mrs. Scarf's house. And she came out one afternoon and she handed my brother Dave a banana and she handed myself a banana and we were sitting on the back porch and she said, with tears strolling